DNA. The guest speaker is Sir Venki Ramakrishnan, and we'll have an introduction and conversation with Priyamvada Natarajan. Nobel laureate Venki Ramakrishnan is a British American structural biologist of Indian origin. He shared the 2009 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for uncovering the structure of the ribosome. He is senior scientist at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology at Cambridge University in the UK. His recent book, Gene Machine, The Race to Decipher the Secrets of the Ribosome, is about the quest to understand the ribosome which decodes genetic information to build all life forms. Priyamvada Natarajan, an astrophysicist and professor at Yale, has made key contributions to our understanding of the black hole. She's the author of Mapping the Heavens, the radical scientific ideas that reveal the cosmos. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Venki Ramakrishnan and Priyamvada Natarajan, presented by DNA. say um, what a real privilege and pleasure it is to have this opportunity to actually interview you. Um, I happen to know Venki for about 15 years now, so it's really quite fun. And I'm delighted to have you all join in on our conversation. <clears throat> so I guess I'm not going to introduce you, Venki, because you, know, you need no introduction at this point, except that you have recently written this very engaging personal memoir of your journey of discovery for the race to reveal the structure of the ribosome. And <clears throat> you've made many seminal contributions to the field of structural biology, which, I mean, of course, the most notable is tracking down the ribosome. And <clears throat> you've also illuminated to us how important the ribosome is compared to uh, its more famous cousin, the DNA. So I want to just dive right in and ask you to talk a little bit about the ribosome, um, its function, and why we should know more about it. Yeah, so uh, that's a very interesting question, because I say in the book that if you mention DNA, everybody nods as if they know what it means. <laughs> they don't actually know what it means, but they sort of think, oh, DNA, that's genes, and we sort of inherit genes, and it sort of makes us what we are. But actually, the ribosome is older than DNA, and it's older than proteins. Why is that important? Because DNA contains genetic information. It's a long molecule that contains instructions for how to make proteins. Each protein has a particular section of DNA that contains information on how to make it. So you can think of the ribosome as this large translating machine that reads the genetic information to make proteins. Why is that important? Well, th we have thousands of genes. Each of those genes codes for a protein. So that means we have thousands of proteins. Now, when we, the normal person thinks of a protein, uh, they think it's something that we need to eat in our diet. You know, we need to have <laughs> enough protein to live on. Or they think it's our muscle, you know, that's what proteins are. But actually, proteins do thousands of functions. The reason you're able to see us now is because of a protein in your eye called rhodopsin, which is a detector of light. The reason you're able to use oxygen is because a protein called hemoglobin captures the oxygen in your lungs and delivers it through the blood to your muscles and tissues. When you get an infection, you make antibodies to fight off the infection. Those antibodies are all proteins. The way you hear, the way you remember, even memory is formed by proteins. So everything about life is made of proteins, and, or, or made possible by proteins. And each protein, 
is made by these fantastic ancient molecular machines called ribosomes, which predate DNA and predate proteins. Because obviously, before there were any proteins, you wouldn't even need DNA to encode proteins. So somehow this molecule came from some ancient form of life called the RNA world. So the ribosome is fascinating, both because of its importance today and its importance to the origin of life, and how life began. So could you also demystify a little bit um, RNA, mRNA, and the relationship to the ribosome? Yes, so DNA is, you can think of it as a collection of all our genes. Anytime the cell wants to use one particular gene to make a protein, it doesn't translate it directly off DNA. The analogy I give is, you can think of DNA as an entire library of books. Say the British Library, which has every book published in Britain. Now when you go to the British Library and you say, I want to read this particular book, they're not going to let you check it out. They're too precious, many of them. So what they'll do is they'll make a copy of the book and let you read the copy. That's what the cell does. It takes a copy of a particular gene, and it's called messenger RNA, because it's a message containing, it's a molecule taking the message from the DNA to the cell where it's needed. And then the ribosome reads that mRNA, or, uh, you know, which is a copy of the gene. So I think um, when you read the book, you um, get a really good feel for also the tools that came in very handy to do this sort of mapping of the structure, which then leads you to understanding the function of the ribosome. So do you want to talk a little bit about um, X-ray crystallography as a tool? Because I want this to lead into you know, a question about sort of your non-traditional entree into the subject. Yeah, so um, you know, when we talk about, first of all, you have to ask, why was the structure of the ribosome important? And that leads to why is it important to be able to visualize something? And visualization has been important in science ever since the beginning of science. For example, until uh, Vesalius dissected bodies and knew what anatomy, human anatomy was, we had misconceptions about human anatomy and we didn't really understand how the human body worked. Similarly, when Galileo trained his telescopes and saw you know, moons of, on planets and so on. That really helped, you know, shape astronomy. In biology, the discovery of the cell made possible by looking with microscopes and the discovery of microbes, that completely changed biology. And it's the same with molecules. If you want to understand how a molecule works, you have to know what it looks like. It would be like understanding how a car worked if you had no idea what a car looked like. And that's the analogy I draw uh, over th throughout the book. Now, X-ray crystallography, which uh, Priya uh, alluded to, is a technique to visualize molecules which are too small to be seen in detail using a light microscope. So it's using a trick, using the idea that you can coax molecules to form crystals and shoot a beam of X-rays and then gather the collected X-rays, and then do what a lens does. A lens simply collects gathered rays to form an image. But you can do that in a computer by doing in a computer what a lens does and form an image. And so that was the idea behind this technique of crystallography. I mean, I think you're absolutely right. Mapping really is knowing. Uh, definitely true in my field as well, that you really understand something when you can map it. So I think I want to ask you a little bit about your non-traditional path into a life in science, the fact that you sort of entered through physics. Would you like to talk a little bit about, do you think that having a non-traditional path actually helped you in some ways? Because you were not, you know, there was no dogma, there was no path, there was no yeah. track. I think it has pluses and minuses. I mean, uh, one thing was that I didn't go to very famous uh, universities uh, until right through my PhD. I did my bachelor's from my local university, Baroda University in Gujarat, and then I went to Ohio University in southeastern Ohio. Uh, neither of them was a major or is a major research establishment. Uh, 
And so, in a sense, you're an outsider in multiple senses. I was an immigrant, but I was also outside what I call the main fast track of science, you know, the Harvard, Berkeley, or MIT, uh, or places like that. And so that then leaves you slightly outside the, where all the current ideas are being discussed and where the, a lot of the action seems to be. Uh, it may have a slight advantage in that people who are in these places are constantly talking to each other and it might result in a sort of pack mentality. You know, there, people tend to follow fashions and fads. And in my case, you know, when I entered the ribosome, it had long already fallen out of fashion. The earliest discoveries that had been made, we knew what the ribosome did, and then the next step seemed to be almost impossible. So nobody was going into that field. And I was slightly naive, and I went into it without sort of realizing that it was not fashionable. And it had a consequence that when I applied for faculty jobs, you know, I applied to 50 universities and didn't get a single interview. And uh, so it had some minuses, but the, the plus side was when the technology became available to tackle it, I was ready, you know. Right. Yeah, no, I think um, it's very nicely put. Um, I find that it resonates with my own experience of feeling like an outsider. I mean, I was an insider in terms of the places that I trained in, but I'm an outside, consummate outsider in the game that I play in by virtue of being a little brown woman. So yeah. I think we, and, but it's been, it's been advantageous in some ways and it's been yeah. a disadvantage. In I some think, ways. you know, there are different types of outsiders, but they all have a, a, sh a common problem. One problem is, and I allude to that slightly in the book, but especially in talks, is that everybody has something called imposter syndrome. Yeah. You go into a field and you think, oh, everybody else is so smart and I don't really belong here. Now, if you're an outsider, whether it's an outsider because you went to lesser universities or you're an immigrant or, or, or you're uh, a woman, uh, you feel that imposter syndrome more uh, than you would otherwise. But actually, everybody has it. So those of you who feel that you're an outsider and you don't belong, I think you should just realize this is just a, a, a problem everybody has. You might have it to a greater degree, but you should just sort of ignore it and get on with what you want to do. Yeah, no. <clears throat> Absolutely, yeah. So I, since we're talking about place, um, I think in the book you talk a lot about the LMB in Cambridge and how it's a really sort of special place. You know, in, um, in physics, in applied physics, there's been another such environment, Bell Labs, that's been written about and talked about a lot. These are sort of incubators for creative, imaginative work and people. So I'm just kind of curious if you could explain to us yeah. what, you, um, what you really saw in the LMB before you became the insider. Yeah. You were there on a sabbatical visit yeah. and you were aware of the work that was happening there. But what was it like, your first encounter into that space? Yeah. And did you immediately realize that so this I, I'll was... I'll start with a story. Well, I'll start with one observation. So when the Howard Hughes Medical Institute decided to start a new uh, research institute of their own, they modeled it after these exact two labs. They modeled it after Bell Labs and the LMB. So I'll come to their properties in a minute, but I want to share an anecdote with you. When I went to the LMB, I had written to Aaron Klug, who was a Nobel laureate who went on to be president of the Royal Society. He was the director of the lab, and I was in huge awe of him. And he assigned his associate, John Finch, who was also very famous, he was a fellow of the Royal Society, to look after me. When I arrived there, he said, I'm sorry, we don't have a place for you, uh, and you know, you'll have to just hang out in the library for a few days. And I said to him, look, I don't need anything special. I'll just sit in a desk in your lab. And he just sort of smiled at me because he didn't have a lab. He only had a desk <laughs> of his own, okay? He had no office, nothing, you know? And so the common thing about the LMB and the, uh, and the and Bell Labs is people worked in small groups. They didn't have big empires. They worked on long-term problems. They didn't care about getting a result tomorrow. They wanted to work on something important. They had stable funding. It's not that they weren't rev reviewed or could just waste their time, but they had a long 
you know, long-term uh, support. And there was no hierarchy. You know, there was, you know, if in my lab, if the lab director signs up for an instrument, if a graduate student has signed up before that person, they have to wait, you know. And in the canteen, there's no faculty table, there's no faculty club. Everybody from the cleaner to the director sits in the same tables. So this creates a common sense of purpose and a collegiality which makes people talk to each other, everybody feels they're in the same boat, so they help each other. And I think that really allows you to be very creative and focus on the science rather than all the, you know, nonsense. But you know, I think there's something also, right, about uh, the way in these, these kinds of institutions hire. Um, they take intellectual risks with people, right? Yes, that's true. Uh, for example, when I wrote to Richard Henderson and asked if I could come to work there on the ribosome, I had no crystals, and you know, there was a group in Germany that had had crystals for 15 years at that time. And um, he just called me up and asked me what my ideas were. You know, it was like a one afternoon conversation, more like an intellectual discussion, and there was no job. You know, it was not like I was applying for a job. I, and then he, said he liked the idea and then created a job, you know. So I think that's the kind of risk that they take. They ask, is this person, you know, worth hiring? Do they, do, does the person have good ideas? And can, can we support the person on the scale that we want? In other words, if I had asked for 20 people, the answer would have been no, you know, because that's not what they do. So um, <clears throat> I think before uh, we move on to talking about the culture of science, um, I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about the potential applications of the work that uh, the scientific work that you've done and I think you mentioned uh, in the book um, antibiotics you know they are very much um, discussed at the moment because it seems that we've exhausted the range of antibiotics that uh, we have and we have all these super resistant bacteria and all these infections right so um, so antibiotic resistance is a worldwide problem and it's especially a problem I would say uh, in countries like India, and there, there are many reasons for that. Now, one reason my work has something to do with it is because the ribosome is such an ancient molecule that the ribosomes of bacteria are slightly different from our own ribosomes. And so there are compounds which will stop bacterial ribosomes, but they won't stop our ribosomes so well. And so many of them, like erythromycin or tetracycline, or streptomycin, which was the first drug against TB, <clears throat> they all bind to the ribosome. So when these structures came out, it was then possible to do the structures with the antibiotics bound, so we could understand exactly how the antibiotics bound to the ribosome and how they blocked the function of the ribosome. And this then led companies to try to see if they could design better antibiotics. To, against the ribosome. And I'm delighted that, you know, a pharmaceutical company in New Haven, where Priya works, uh, was actually able to f find many lead compounds which were promising. Uh, my brother-in-law recently showed me a paper in which one of our structures was used to des design antibiotics that were effective against mycobacteria in culture. But going from these compounds to a an antibiotic, like a medicine that you can give to patients, is a long process because you have to go through lots of things like whether the thing, antibiotic is absorbed, whether it's effective when given orally or intramuscularly, whether uh, it's kine pharmacokinetics, that is how long it stays in your body is okay, and above all, whether it has any toxic uh, properties. So this requires a huge uh, amount of in investment and so on. And unfortunately, that hasn't happened. Uh, there have been no new class of antibiotics for almost 20 years. And why is this? It's because of the current model for right. drug development. The current model for drug development doesn't really it's broken, work. it's both in the United States and in the United Kingdom, right? It's yeah, basically everywhere. It's a worldwide problem. And the problem is that if you have antibiotics, 
you don't want to use a new antibiotic for every infection. You only want to reserve it for those which are not treatable with cheap antibiotics. So then your patient pool is very small. And moreover, if your antibiotic is good, the patient is cured in a week, okay? So he's not, the per patient is not a lifelong customer, so like a cholesterol drug or a blood pressure drug, or even a, you know, something like a cancer treatment. So the, the amount of money that they can make doesn't seem worth the risk of developing, because it costs a billion dollars to develop a new drug. So my uh, feeling is that antibiotic development must be spearheaded by governments, by international organizations, by nonprofits, and so on. And I want to remind the audience that one of the first antibiotics in this modern era, penicillin, was developed by the British government as in response to World War II. It was not initially developed by a private company. So there's, there's a precedent for it. So uh, before I move on to um, talking about the cult scientific culture, big science and so on, you know, we've had lots of fun conversations over 15 years about science, having wet walks in Cambridge. So I thought I'd ask you a fun question and, you know, and uh, we're on the dinner party circuit of the <laughs> chattering classes. So if you had this hypothetical dinner party that you could invite six people to, which three scientists, and since I already know that you love classical music, which three musicians, composers, who would you invite, living or dead? So you want three scientists and three yeah. musicians. Well, I think that's, that would be hard. I, I, I suppose I would, you know, I, I mean, Newton was a great scientist, but I think he was not a I very... I he was not a nice guy. You don't not a nice guy. I mean, maybe not even a social guy. That's the, you could be a, I don't mind people who are not nice, as long as they're interesting. But, you know, if, if they're antisocial, uh, I'm not sure. So, so maybe Einstein would have been a great example. He was, you know, really uh, very witty and, and, and eloquent. But apparently he mumbled. Uh, hmm? Apparently he mumbled, though. Well, you'd have to put up with that. Yeah. And then, uh, I suppose, you know, Francis Crick, I actually saw him, and it's one of my lifetime regrets that I didn't go and say hello to him. I was too shy, even though I'd done work which was directly related to one of his hypotheses. And uh, so I think Francis Crick would have been another. And maybe, since I have a physicist and a, and a, a geneticist, maybe I would choose a, a chemist, uh, maybe Linus Pauling or somebody like that. Uh, and so, so those would be my three scientists. Uh, in terms of musicians, I, I suppose I would, uh, well, my obvious choice would be uh, my son, although I would like to sort of choose my son and daughter-in-law as a couple, if you don't mind. It'll hel help me get, <laughs> stay out of... I extra points for that. Yeah, you knew it'll, I would it'll help me time. stay out of trouble uh, <laughs> with my family. Anyway, so those would be obvious choices. They're both professional musicians. And uh, I would want... Uh, Somebody, I, I'm a big fan of Carnatic music, and so uh, I, I don't know, somebody like uh, Madurai Mani Ayer or MS Subalakshmi, maybe MS Subalakshmi uh, would be uh, somebody I would choose. And uh, I think, you know, uh, in North Indian music, I really enjoyed Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan, yes. and uh, you know, it would also be a symbolic thing for an uh, Indian-born uh, scientist to choose a, a Pakistani musician because the music he sang really didn't have those boundaries of partition. You know, Amir Khosro, you know, Chap Tilak, we heard that somewhere uh, here today. Uh, that's, that was composed in Delhi, you know, by Amir Khosro, you know, but it's by everybody. Okay, that sounds cool. Uh... <laughs> So let's um, talk about the culture of science that um, you have uh, you've shared a lot of um, an insider's view and uh, offered a real constructive critique. So I think that you know there are lots of toxic practices that um, scupper and inhibit discovery and don't encourage young people to stay on. And you know this whole hankering after fame and recognition. So I think, you know, um, 
I also in my writing have felt that we've got to debunk this completely sanitized image of a scientist, you know, white lab coat, extracting objective truths from nature or whatever. I mean, it's a human endeavor, right? And we have our passions, we, have, we are um, emotional, we are emotionally invested in our ideas, although we try not to be. And it's all about rivalries and, and uh, you know, rush for fame and awards. So if you had to suggest a couple of ways in which you could reform the system of science. Yeah. <clears throat> I think, you know, well, firstly, I don't think you'll ever get rid of it because I feel, feel it's deeply embedded in human nature. And I also talk in the book about competition is a double-edged thing. Yeah. You know, just as in the free market, uh, competition can spur on innovation, it can accelerate the pace of discovery, and it can actually move science forward very rapidly. Uh, whereas we've seen time and again when people have monopolies in science, uh, things be become, people become complacent, you know, and, and things don't move, and that happened in the ribosome case. And so it's a double-edged sword, and what I say is cap competition is good for science, but it's very bad for scientists because you know, it creates a lot of stress and, you know, you're worried about, you know, being scooped and so on. So, so I talk a lot about the tension of having to compete with people when, you know, the goal, uh, you know, is, is similar or sometimes identical. Um, I think, however, while competition is intrinsic and while human nature, you know, has some you know, innate properties, the system tends to exacerbate it. And the way the system rewards people by, you know, prizes, by plucking out people, you know, into winners and losers, as if it's a sporting competition, I think that, that can change. The idea that we have to only publish in certain journals to be recognized, uh, that too, you know, is, should be changed, but again, is going to be difficult to change because the reason people publish in these journals is to get noticed. And the reason they get noticed is because most science is so specialized, you can't evaluate a person's work. And so most people use the journals as a proxy to decide whether the work is important or not. So there are lots of problems. It's a bit lazy, right? I mean, it's, la of... it's lazy, but you know, you can't really blame them. I mean, yeah. when you look at Nature or Science, which are general interest magazines, supposedly, general interest magazines. When I publish a paper in science, even though there's a continuum throughout, from the front to the back, starting with your field, you know, yeah. cosmology, and ending up with some genetics or something, the, I cannot even understand the paper in front of my mine or the one behind mine. It's right. that specialized, okay? So we cannot blame scientists either. So there are innovative ways for trying to change this, but it's going to take time, but we're all trying to make that effort. But my view is that funding bodies, the organizations that actually fund scientists, will have to at some point enforce change. Without that, it won't happen. Right. I mean, and I, I personally feel, as a, as a younger scientist, one of the key challenges has been um, you know, sort of not capitulating to this notion of success and uh, not sort of hankering after. But as you said, right, this is the psychological side of science itself. And the fact that we are, deep, it's a deeply human creative activity, just like writing, just like the arts. And um, yeah. so it's going to be quite hard to, but I think that- But you know, even in the arts and music, I know my son's a professional musician. It is incredibly competitive, competitive. and very, you know, hierarchical and pe people get famous, hanker after recognition. And it's almost worse because it's much more subjective than right. science. Right. So, you know, that's why I think, you know, this is deeply embedded. I mean, humans, ever since we formed tribes, you know, tend to sort of set up hierarchies and that's right. what happens. Yeah. So, but I mean, I was wondering, some of it, as you said, is the way in which research has been institutionalized doesn't help. So the move to big science, these very large projects involving thousands of people, which necessitates a hierarchical structure to manage the science and get yeah. it done. That isn't helping. And for example, in my field, 
these many other ways of doing science, like working in small groups, like some people like me have um, yeah. taken on, that is actually quite risky and challenging because the move is towards big science. Yeah. So we need to, don't you think in science we need to allow many different ways of doing science? Yeah, I think there's no question. We have to support both small-scale science, which is where I think ideas often start. You know, by the time you have the Higgs boson, That's you right. already have an elaborate theory that made people confident enough to build this machine to look for it, Absolutely. okay? But the cru crucial ideas were not done by hundreds of people. And um, maybe that's one reason, I think the Nobel has many, uh, you know, issues and I talk about them, but maybe that's one reason why the Nobel probably decided, you know, we want to give it to the people who came up with the original ideas. And so, uh, but on the other hand, if you want to discover the Higgs boson, or do sequence the human genome, or do large-scale, uh, collect large-scale genetic data, there's almost no uh, substitute for you know, right. some large-scale science. One solution is to have open data collection and then have you know, small groups being able to analyze it and, and you know, interpret it and so well, on. I and that's happening with genetic yeah, well, data. I think it's really about the funding model. I think yes. the funding model has to recognize that there are many different ways of approaching problems. Sure. Complex yeah. problems yeah. even, right? So um, I want to now come to um, talking a little bit uh, about Indian science and the fact that, you know, we've had a very strong legacy, but for several generations, we've been operating under scarcity of resources. And so, uh, but now, um, there's a lot of money uh, that's being pumped into basic sciences. And I think that we are moving away from the scarcity mindset. That transition is going to take a little bit more time. But I was uh, wondering what you had to say to talented young people who now want to go into science in India, especially the basic sciences. I, I think, well, there is more money in Indian science, but I should say the investment of Indian science is about 0.7% of GDP. Now, Britain is considered very low among the OECD countries, and it's 1.7%, and the government has now committed to increasing it to 2.4%, which would bring it to sort of the middle or so of the OECD. Countries like South Korea, Israel, invest 3 to 4% of GDP. So 0.7% is nothing. I'm talking a fraction of GDP. I'm not talking of matching them, you know, dollar for dollar. Uh, so I would say India is tremendously underinvesting in science, even in comparison to its GDP. The other problem in India is, in most countries, private R&D is double to triple that of government R&D. In India, it's about half of what government R&D is. So it's like a factor of five different from, from many other countries like South Korea and so on. So I think, you know, first of all, India needs to invest more, but Indian private industries need to really step up to do much more R&D. Now, the second part is about what to say to young people. I think science is not a lucrative career unless you happen to that you can use, which many people do, by the way, which results in your starting up a company and the startup works and, you know, you, uh, you know, you do something that's good and beneficial and also make a lot of money. That's fine. But by and large, it's not a lucrative profession. But it is a very interesting profession. You and know, it's rewarding about... rewarding in its own way. Rewarding in its own way. Uh, yeah. And, and, the, and it's so interesting because you're trying every day to find out something that nobody else knows. When you discover something, you may be the first person on the planet ever in the history of humanity to know that fact. So that's what really, I think, is the motivating factor behind scientists. Yeah, the joy of figuring things out for yourself, yeah. right? Um, so I'm also um, curious about what you think, you know, in biology and in genetics, um, it's a particularly exciting time. Uh, lots of incredible <coughs> improvements.
new discoveries. In particular, um, we hear a lot about you know, Jennifer and Emmanuel's work on the CRISPR-Cas9, uh, which is the new gene editing. The possibilities are tremendous. They're exciting. They're scary. So I wonder, um, first of all, did you anticipate any of these? Because you're sort of hovering in the same space. And yeah. these discoveries also bring up lots of ethical issues. And I wondered, in your hat as the president of the Royal Society, yeah. how do you think about, I mean, is there a way in which you think the public should have a say in how these technologies are used or controlled? Yeah. Should it be governments? Should it be citizens? How do you think about this? Yeah. So, um, you know, the discovery of CRISPR-Cas, um, it's a method. So, people had fig tried to figure out how to insert corrected DNA or new DNA into a specific part of our genome. So, you take our chromosome, and you want to cut it at precisely one point and either correct a genetic defect or introduce a completely new gene at that position. And it turned out that if you cut the DNA, the cell does that much more efficiently. And people had figured out how to cut DNA very specifically using older techniques like zinc finger nucleases or talon nucleases. And these have been used for uh, genetic uh, gene therapy then came along CRISPR-Cas, which was allowed you to cut DNA, but in a, more, in a very straightforward way. You could simply define, almost synthesize the sequence you wanted to cut, and you could incorporate it and cut it. So it was much easier. So the technique became more powerful in a way that anybody could do. And so that's led to a much wider adoption of this method for gene editing. Uh, and what it does is it allows, so there's several things in biology. I'll, I'll talk about gene editing since yeah. you mentioned that yeah. first. So this allows us to correct genetic dis diseases if we want. Uh, it allows us to introduce uh, new genes. It allows us to eliminate certain traits or introduce certain traits. So this has some consequences. First of all, the technique is it's not clear the technique is safe for use in humans. You can try it, you know, you can always test it in animals or plants, and you can choose the plants that are healthy and that grow well, and that's fine, and you can discard the rest. You can't do that with a human. You know, if you have a child or somebody you want to uh, correct a gene in, you'd better be pretty sure that it's going to work, you know, at least as well as, say, surgery or something. So, you know, so the safety has to be assured. That's still developing. The other is that if, if you ask most people, would you want to correct a serious genetic defect that you already have? Uh, people would say, yes, absolutely. Why do I want to suffer with cystic fibrosis or you know, some other disease when you can insert healthy cells in me that will be resistant you know, and I won't have it? And then that's, nobody has any qualms about that. That's called somatic cell mutation. That is, you mutate the cells in your own body. The second thing is called germline mutation. This is where you correct mutations that you can pass on to your offspring. They inherit it, and then they inherit this correction forever, okay, or until it's randomly mutated again, but effectively forever. So what you're doing now is you're introducing a genetic change that affects all future generations, okay? That's a more serious step, because how do you know that this mutation isn't useful for some other thing? You know, a classic example is sickle cell anemia. It doesn't help most of us, it's actually deleterious. But if you live in a malaria-infested North Africa, then having one, one allele, that is one of your two chromosomes carrying this mutation, actually helps you, okay? So that's, a, that's an example of how a mutation might be helpful in some circumstances, but not others. And so we, don't, we have to be very, very careful about how we choose diseases. A third problem is when you get beyond that. You know, uh, I, I know you don't like me to bring up Jim Watson, but Jim Watson has all these eugenics if ideas. the audience hasn't uh, noticed, I rolled my eyes big time. 
So Jim Watson has all these eugenics ideas, you know? And people think, you know, wouldn't it be okay if we had, you know, uh, you know, traits for being tall or being very fast or being, you know, having blue eyes or blonde hair or something? You know, then you start getting into designer humans. And I think most people, reasonable people, would be very uncomfortable with that. And the reason is that we don't know, we're far too ignorant to know what makes a good human being. That's number one. And the second is there is no one way of being good. In other words, you, if you try to end up with a monoculture of human beings, you will not have a resilient population. Our resilience, you know, our ability to evolve, to adapt, depends on our diversity. And so that's the reason not to go down that path. Right, but do you think who should be doing the policing of the applications it's, of the technology? It's very, very difficult. So the National Academy of Sciences, the Royal Society, and the Chinese Academy of Sciences uh, came together in 2015, in December, and then we had a second meeting about three months ago in Hong Kong. And we have come up with a set of what we think are reasonable guidelines for how they should proceed. Now we want to involve all of the world's leading academy of sciences, but we have to come to an international agreement on this. The reason is, if we don't, then people may go to some country that permits it, you know, just for right, tourism, there, yeah. medical tourism, and you know, they'll get their procedure done there. So I think this has to be done on an international level by governments. Okay, so um, before uh, we close and open up um, to the audience for questions, I'm just curious, so what do you think is the most exciting problem, um, I don't know, in your field, anything else? What, I what is it that you think um, <coughs> you are most excited reading about, want to know about, or want to delve in yourself? Yeah. So I'll stick, you know, I but talk, obviously you're gonna get I, I, talk in, I talk in the book about post novelitis, <laughs> which is, so I have two diseases, pre novelitis and post novelitis. <laughs> pre novelitis is when scientists have done something very important and people around them are saying, you know, this field could win a Nobel Prize and they're suddenly wondering whether they're in the running or not. The post novelitis is, you know, after you get the Nobel Prize, people think you're some sort of genius. And they start asking you all sorts of questions about the future of humanity and this and that. And, and, and pretty soon, these Nobel laureates start believing in their own genius, you know? <laughs> and, and they start answering the questions, okay? <laughs> and, and so, so I, I'm trying very hard to immunize myself against post-novelitis. So I'll stick to what I know. So I, I mentioned at the beginning of the talk why it's important to visualize something. Why is it important to visualize molecules? And what has happened in the last few years as a result of things, for example, one of the things was something my colleague Richard Henderson started 25, 30 years ago, is a revolution in the field of electron microscopy, which allows us to look at molecules without getting crystals, actually even within cells. And what this will allow us to do is look at molecules almost in action while they're in the process of doing things, while they're connecting with each other in the cell. So we will have, be able to visualize cells at different stages in greater detail than we ever could imagine before. And every time we have gone to a new step in visualization, we've revolutionized our understanding of, of biology. That's true of every other field. Well, you might have gotten a few extra points with me if you had said black holes, but you know, there you go. This sounds very exciting. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> anyway, at this point, I think I'd like to open up to questions. Um, let's see. I think um, the person here. Thank you for the lovely lecture. You expressed an interest in music. Can you explain how music affects the ribosome in the neuron? Does it, <laughs> does it start dancing or does it produce more protein? <laughs> I don't, I'm afraid it does neither, I think. 
I think music is, I, music is a little bit of a mystery. Why do we even like music? You know, it, what is the evolutionary purpose of music? I think uh, there's something quite interesting in why we, all humans in every society uh, love music. And uh, it's, there's something deep and fundamental about it, but I don't understand it, but I'm grateful it exists. Uh, there's a woman in the red shawl slash scarf there. Yeah. There's a guy. Yeah, there's a guy in front. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Okay. So, uh, Young you uh, spoke about the lack of funding that we have in India for science. It's very limited. Uh, would you agree that the problem is actually about the attitude to science when you have, you know, a couple months ago at the Indian Science Conference, very senior people and. Supposedly, scientists said that, talking about, uh, you know, in the Vedic period, there, were, there was plastic surgery and all that sort of thing. So what would you have to say about that? I, I think this is not characteristic of most Indian scientists. Most yeah. Indian scientists are, are quite mainstream and serious. And frankly, most of them don't go to the Indian Science Congress, okay? And uh, I would say this, this reflects a very, very small number of individuals, you know, who are not serious scientists. And Actually, they, shouldn't be, all, they should right? not be taken seriously, okay? That's all I say. That's it. The young person in the hoodie. Actually, I wanted to ask about the Indian science scene only, uh, but uh, she asked the question of, like, what do you think would be the uh, solutions that the, because the government, is the funding that is happening also is quite ideological. So, uh, what do you think would be the solutions towards improving the Indian science scene? I think, you know, you have to realize that funding, you know, the funding of science in India works in very much the same way as funding in other countries. You know, you have to apply, there are some expert committees that decide whether you should get your grant or not. Uh, if you don't get a grant, you al almost always feel that they've been very unfair, uh, but you never complain if they actually give you the money. Uh, so uh, it's, it's the same everywhere. Uh, I think the, there may be, I don't know enough about what, what is the current situation, but I think it's always important to separate government politics from the administration of science. Yeah. So in Britain, there's a very famous principle called the Haldane Principle. What that principle says is government is responsible for spending money. That money comes from the people, it from, comes from taxpayers. So government has a right to say what their priorities are. Let's say their priorities are clean energy or clean water or you know, uh, health vaccinations or uh, malaria eradication. Those are all valid priorities and they are quite right if they ask scientists, you need to help us with these problems, that's perfectly fine, okay? But then they should not tell scientists how to go about doing it, okay? And if scientists tell them, look, you're asking us to do this problem, but this problem is not ready yet. In order to do this, we need to understand this, this, and this first. So if you want to attack malaria at the long term, we have to understand how parasites work first. And we have to understand fundamental uh, biology of parasites. That's okay. That's a dialogue, okay? But s government should never tell scientists in detail how to spend the money, but they have the right to set priorities because it is taxpayers' money. It's not scientists who are spending their money out of their own pocket. Yeah, but I think, you know, in India we have the model of ISRO, which is an absolutely fantastic top-rated space agency in the world, and that's been autonomous, autonomous from political interference, right? So. And I personally think we should also spend less on the military and more on science. But, you know, let's not go there. But let's um, move to this side of, there's a person here, and then we'll go back to the other side. Uh, you mentioned observing the molecules, electron microscopy. But I remember long years back, Heisenberg, Heisenberg made a principle that the very act of observation changes the object. So how do you, how does these two things uh, um, Maria. <laughs> yes, th that is true, but the, the shift in the object in this particular case uh, is so small compared to the level of detail that you're looking at uh, that it's not an issue. 
okay? So it doesn't really come into play here. The only, the place where quantum mechanics plays a role in electron microscopy is because electrons are waves, and you have to use that wave-like property of, of electrons. The person over there in the red sweater. Sir, tuberculosis is still uh, not eradicated, and even after so much technological advancement, uh, why treatment takes so many months or even years? And can we have some wonder drugs to treat tuberculosis in weeks? Yes. So, so you're asking the wrong Ramakrishnan because my sister is the expert on. TB. And it is true that there is now multi-drug resistant TB, uh, but there is still, for the most part, uh, treatable drugs. I mean, treatable, useful drugs against TB if you don't have one of these multi-drug resistant uh, forms of TB. Uh, the problem of treating multi-drug resistant TB is related to developing new antibiotics. And that's related to the problems I discussed, which is people have to feel uh, that there's a profit in it. And I think, you know, part of the problem with TB is it's a problem of developing countries, yeah. and so that people feel maybe there's not enough money to be made. Uh, I don't know all the reasons, uh, but that's definitely something that, uh, there are companies who, who are trying to work on that. The person right there. Come to you very fascinating and very charming discussion we had. But I wonder whether this could be translated in simple language because children of a certain age group, you know, as they grow, they should know about the basic science. So simplification in, in terms of translation in various Indian languages, do you think? And we say some project which can do this simplification and also translate in different languages so that, you know, wider understanding of your yeah. research. So, I think that is that very necessary. Yes. So that's a good point. And actually, uh, my, my book is aimed at somebody who has had some high school science, some high school biology and physics. Uh, if you've had that, you ought to be able to read my book. Even if you don't understand every detail, you'll get some sense uh, of what the book is about. So it's for a general reader. It's not for a scientist. Now, your point about books for children in local languages. I have many times advocated that the majority of Indians don't go to English medium schools. And they should be learning science in their local languages. You know, if you're Polish or German or uh, Scandinavian, you learn science in your local language, and then you learn English, and then when you become a scientist, you have to obviously know English well. But your early formative years, when you're learning the concepts, you have to learn it in a language that you are familiar with. So I'm a very strong advocate of having good books for children and for you know, older children being translated into local languages. But it also requires training teachers in those languages. Uh, there's a huge uh, round of uh, debate on genetically modified organisms and especially the crops when we talk about. Uh, leave aside the ethical part uh, in animals. Uh, I just wanted to know what are your views on genetically modified plants, the crop plants? Yeah. So my view is you have to look at genetic technology as a tool, not as an end product. And when you have a plant, if it has a certain trait, like whether it's herbicide resistant or uh, some other kind of property, it almost doesn't matter whether it was genetically modified uh, by using these new tools or whether it was randomly selected by breeding, okay? And in fact, in some ways, genetically modified plants are much more precise. You know exactly where the gene was modified. You have almost more controls over uh, those plants. The reason many people are opposed to GM crops is because many of the GM crops have been developed 
by a very few multinational companies. So they're worried about monopoly practices, about uh, producing varieties which are not necessarily what the country needs or what people need, but what may result in profit for the company. A classic example is a highly herbicide resistant plant which makes it easier to grow because you can blast the field with herbicide, which is also sold by the same company. So that's, those are examples uh, of uh, things that, say, environmentalists and others object to. Uh, there was a recent article in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which showed, which did a large scale study, it showed the more strongly people opposed GM crops, the less they actually knew about molecular biology or genes, right. okay? So, so this is a, an issue, you know? People are confusing the tool with multinational corporations. The front, the front, the front. Yeah. Uh, so we understand that among so many genes, only a few of them manifest and this depends on the environment, the epigenetics. So where does ribosome fit into this pattern? So the ribosome will translate every gene that's expressed. First of all, it's not true what you said. In every cell, thousands of genes are required simply to keep the cell alive, okay? These are called housekeeping genes, you know? And then different cells will express different genes. These are not necessarily epigenetic. I know epigenetic is a big fashionable buzzword today, but the reality is if you have a skin cell, it's going to express melanin and certain and collagen and things which are related to skin. If you have a neuron, it's going to express a different set of genes. But all of them will express all of the genes needed to provide energy, to provide, make membranes, to keep the cell alive. And ribosomes will translate every gene in every cell. Thank you for a, a very interesting talk. This is a question to both the panelists. Um, we have a White House today. You have a what? A White House oh, today no. <laughs> that uh, has uh, put up the walls on immigration. It took a long time to uh, appoint a national science advisor. No, I'm sorry. Could you hold it a little? I'm a little. I'm sorry. Deaf. Can you hear me better now? Yes. Yeah, we have a White House today that um, has put up the walls on immigration. Um, took a long time to appoint a national science advisor and has uh, declared a cold war on China. Can uh, both of you kindly comment on what, this, what impact this may have in terms of America's position, uh, you know, in terms of leadership in science? Do you want to go first, well, since you live there? I was going to say, I don't know where to start. Um, right now, we have a partial government shutdown, so NASA, NSF, a CDC, all of these very important arms of the government that uh, are centered around science and technology and interaction with people um, and our day-to-day -day life are shut down. So, I mean, the only thing I can say is um, I am um, an optimist, so I hope to remain and manage to remain optimistic for the next uh, couple of years. Um, it's quite dreadful. What else can I say? <laughs> So I would say, um, so I won't talk about countries and uh, you know, nations as a whole, but science has always depend on free movement. This, me this is free movement of people and movement of ideas because they go together. You look at something like quantum mechanics, it originated in, in Europe, uh, largely in Germany with a, uh, some in Britain and France, and then, you know, Americans went to Europe to study and brought back quantum mechanics and then developed it further. So this sort of movement of ideas happens all the time, okay? Uh, you know, new, positional new notation originated in India, went to Europe through uh, er, Arab countries, and, and then, you know, in modern times, you know, uh, the, the British uh, introduced s some ideas of European science. Uh, to India. So it's always a multi-way traffic. So I think Trump is wrong to worry about immigration as a big problem. But Trump is a symptom. 
of a large-scale malaise, which is also, uh, you know, the causes are different, but Brexit is another example. Uh, there are uh, real problems in, uh, within the EU in many different European countries, including Germany. <clears throat> there are problems in uh, India, as you know. Uh, India also is not so fond of immigration. And uh, so this has to do with the fact that globalization is not benefiting people universally, okay? In all of these countries, there's a group. Uh, Priya and I belong to this group of, you know, New York Times, Guardian readers uh, who don't know anybody else, actually. And uh, we don't realize these people in Ohio or Arkansas who have not seen their incomes go up for 40 years, you know, and slowly declining standard of living and no jobs. So there is a real problem. And until these societies address these inequalities, uh, I'm afraid we're going to have a very difficult time. Right, and I think that, you know, the, what the American paradox is that the country leading edge of science and technology also has rampant denialism of science. And that is pre-Trump, and that's, you know, been around for a while. I personally think that demystifying the process of science, the kinds of conversations that are happening here where people really understand how science works and um, the process can really help. Um, I think we have time for just two more questions. So I think we have one person here who's had their hand up for a while and you. Only one, she says. Only one? Okay, if you can be really quick, I can squeeze in, otherwise we're... Okay, so my question is not to do with uh, ribosomes or genetics, okay. even though it's a big area of interest. The two of you had a conversation about being an outsider in more ways than one. And I want to specifically ask you, since you studied physics and then moved interdisciplinary, as it were, to biology, uh, and that resonates in more ways than one, do you think it had any significance in what you did afterwards? Did it matter? Uh, it, it may have because I used a very physical technique, yes. which is using synchrotron radiation and X-ray crystallography to look at a biological problem. So almost by accident, you could say, well, not really, because of my background, maybe I was sort of drawn to that. Uh, I was sort of at the interface between using a physical technique and looking at a biological problem. So it may have helped, but you know, Tom Stites was not trained as a physicist and he did just fine. So I, I'm, not, I'm not sure it's, it was ne necessary. So one final quick question. Yeah. <clears throat> My question is, uh, do you think faith is the enemy of science? It has been in the past, do you think it is? And is that a reason why uh, efforts in India towards science are muted because we are a fairly faith-based society. Faith, 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 religious faith is what... They don't, they, they may, they can be antagonistic, but they don't have to be. Uh, many well-known scientists uh, were religious. Uh, today, I would say many scientists are not, uh, but I don't think they have to be but I think they belong to somewhat different spheres. Science depends on evidence that uh, is based on experiments that anyone can reproduce. The whole premise of science is you don't take anything on faith. You have to verify. And faith, on the other hand, is a personal thing. You're, you're accepting something because you believe in it, not because there's some demonstrable evidence that you can demonstrate to another. So I think there are different spheres and the problem comes when you try to mix the two spheres and they don't really go well right. together. I think, you know, just wanted to echo that faith is a deeply personal thing and I think it should be part of your personal realm. And I, I totally concur with Venki that it's, it would be a category mistake. You no, know, it's rather like asking what is the taste of color blue, right? So faith and science really. Um, but anyway, at this point, I think uh, we need to wrap up. And I want to say thank you to all of you for your attention. And thanks to Venki for a fun conversation. A very warm thanks. Go to Sir Venki Ramakrishnan.
and to Priyam Vada Natarajan, also to DNA for presenting the session. And the next session will start in about 12 minutes, that is South Asia.